Tottenham, stick it in the goal Come on Tottenham, the base are bloody slow You are the first team, the last team, my dreams have ever seen Put on that lily white and run on to that green White Hart Lane has seen its pain, it's had its loads of nights We fought our team through thick and thin and all those boring nights And when the game is done we'll sing a song and talk it out all night Hey, Come on Tottenham, stick it in the goal Come on Tottenham, don't be so bloody slow You are the first team, the last team, my dreams have ever seen Hi, it's episode 17, season 5, Tottenham Hotspur, family podcast My name's Jav, joining me this week, Andy Rockall or otherwise known as Stato from the Echoes of Glory podcast. Hello. Hiya. Right, um, we're going to... Well, we've got a lot to get through, obviously. Burnley yesterday, Barcelona before that. It'd be rude not to, not to talk about the Barcelona game. Um, yeah, fantastic fan, fantastic uh, uh, performance that was. Um, we'll also be talking um, about the Spurs shirt book, which um, uh, you worked on, a researcher, I believe. That's correct, yes. Um, we'll talk a little little bit more about that and, and your involvement with, with that book, and and and, and as ever, we'll, we'll take um, questions from listeners. But before we do, as it's your first time on the Tottenham Hotspur Family Podcast, um, very briefly, how did you get bitten by the Tottenham bug? I'm definitely indoctrinated by my family. Um, my dad's a, a lifelong Tottenham fan. His father and two brothers uh, all used to go together. Um, so I guess I had little other choice, but I, I didn't want to support anyone else when I was six and dad said, do you want to go to football? We went to Tottenham and, and, and we did. And my first game was the 1980 FA Youth Cup final. Spurs won on the night 1-0, uh, beating West Ham. Uh, and then West Ham got given the cup as they won the first leg 2-0. But you try and explain aggregate to a six-year-old who's <laughs> crying his eyes out. I didn't quite understand it. And... Um... Well, I, I know the answer to this question anyway, but favourite Spurs player? Um, all-time favourite is probably Jurgen Klinsmann for his astonishing time at the club. It was all, all too short. Um, so if I was to look bigger picture, I'd probably say Glenn Hoddle. But the time Jurgen was with us, he was arguably the, the greatest striker in the world that first year. And he just worked so hard. He was like a lesson to everyone else. And sadly, that lesson didn't part or permeate through the club as it should have done but um he was a phenomenal player and i idolized him i think it's very difficult to explain to perhaps younger listeners who who, who weren't um around um or either weren't born or weren't old, old enough to, to, to remember but particularly that first spell he had with us yeah and it was only a season that 94-95 season um you know it was a time when we started getting um foreign players an influx of foreign players in, in english football obviously um, we we had Aussie and, and, and Ricky Veer back in '78, but generally um, it, it wasn't. We, we didn't have as, as many foreign, foreign players as, 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 as we do today in the game. So it's quite a big thing, World Cup winner and all that. I remember an article. So he played first spell was what '94 '95 season. I remember reading an article um, about a year, eighteen months later, in the run up to Euro '96. I can't remember who who wrote the article, but it was all about Klinsmann and. There was a phrase in there which which will stick with me forever, and and it said something it said along the lines of that one season with Klinsmann was like five seasons with with any other player, mm. and I and I, I really think that's true. I think it was it's, it, it was a remarkable season. Anyway, let's talk about the present. Um, Tuesday evening, we went to Barcelona. We pulled off what many said was the impossible hand on heart. I didn't think we'd we'd we'd, we'd go there and get a result. I didn't think that we'd. Um, qualify for for the last sixteen. Hope maybe, but realistically, I couldn't see it going into that game. Andy, did did you think that we could pull off a, pull off a, the, the result that we needed? I honestly thought we just had a puncher's chance, and and that was all we had really to to actually get the result we needed. I expected that we'd need to win. Um, okay, PSV did, did us a favour. For everyone who says you know Tottenham are Spursy, there's a saying in Inter that Inter's going to Inter. Um, so for their fans, it's quite plausible that they've managed to uh, to foul this up. But, you know, we we went out there and we were the better team against, OK, a week in Barcelona, but they still had Rakitic, said £100 million Dembele. You know, there was a lot of experienced players in there and a lot of talented young players. Um, we rode our luck a few times. The, the woodwork was hit a couple of times. 
We certainly got exposed early on. Maybe that was a little naive. Um, that's a phrase I've used more than once, if anyone knows knows me, in our European football of probably the last four years, really, is how naive we can be in these Champions League games. We're not battle-hardened. But, you know, maybe we're getting there. Maybe we showed a bit in the second half and we just kept plugging away and plugging away. And if, if we had 17 shots at goal in the new Camp. It's just... It was an incredible performance. And we just kept attacking. The substitutions kept being more and more attacking. Um, you know, Sissoko was everywhere, but you, the last thing you expected him was to go to right back. But we had to just to get more forward players on. And, you know, Walker Peters had, had probably run his course and, and, and run his legs out. But it was just a phenomenal performance. Now, now critics might say that it was a weakened Barcelona team Messi was only on the bench etc etc to which I would counter that um, they were still a very good Barcelona team Messi still came off the the, the bench um, uh, later in the, sec- in, in the second half and the circumstances um, that we were faced with needing to go there to get a re- result in your final game with all that pressure yeah. in the in the new camp of all of, of all places and you know, we had a fair share of our players out in out injured as well very much um, so, so it, it was one of those uh i hasten to use the phrase um glory glory nights it, it, it was what where, where do you think it stands in 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 the pantheon of, of, of pochettino um great uh performances uh i think it's definitely up there as one of the best honestly i do um if you compare it to other great european nights in the recent times I definitely put it above the uh, San Siro against um, AC Milan. I didn't actually think that was a great AC Milan side back then. Mm. Um, Inter, when we beat them, yet they've been European champions. Um, But that was different. That was a home game in Wild Lane. But I honestly think he's one of the the best managerial performances under Pochettino. People have questioned him um, lately, his use of substitutions. Look how many games we've won recently with the substitute playing a key, key role. Now, that might well be a first-team player coming off the bench. But these guys would run on empty. They're coming off the back of a World Cup summer. With A lot of them went so deep into the tournament. A lot of them have come back and suffered muscular injuries already this season. So the management of the squad, I think, has been first-class from Pochettino. And, and that has has meant taking the likes of Ericsson or Delhi um, in and out of games and replacing you know guys like Mora and Lamella, who definitely were starters earlier in the season not quite kept the levels up, they get to come in for games. And then if they can't perform at the level required, they can't start the weekend because they didn't do didn't deliver. Mm. Looking, looking ahead. So the, the the draw for the last 16 is, is tomorrow. Is there any particular team that you fancy? Within reason, uh, you know, I think everyone would want to avoid Tottenham to an extent. I mean, if you're looking OK, Bayern Munich, they're not as good as they once were. Real Madrid are definitely not the team that's won it three years running. They're really struggling now. Knockout, you know, when we get to, to February and March, when these games are going to get played, it's about how people are playing then. They've got the chance to refresh their squads in the in the January window. Um, and form can, can you know, that is now can be very different by then. We could suffer. We could have lost the key player by then mm. um, through injury. So you never know. Porto would look like the easiest team, but, you know, they won five of their six games. They're, they're experienced campaigners in this competition. You know, we, we kind of, we're getting there with, three, four, you know, three or four years worth of experience, but we seem to have played the same game over and over, not, you know, 20 odd different games where we've learnt from them. So everyone, you know, we owe Juventus one, but hey, now they've got Ronaldo. They're going to be an improved side on, on last year. But, I'm, I'm a firm, firm believer that um, particularly with, with with European football, it, it's a learning curve. And if you if you go back to years and years ago, um, when when um, uh, Sir Alex Ferguson's United team in in, in the early nineties entered the competition, I know the format was slightly different. It was it was the early stage of, of the, the, the the Champions League. It was sort of uh, going from what it had been previously before a straight knockout competition in, in, yeah. in the European Cup and the United team struggled early on now some of that was to do with the um, ruling about the number of foreign players you, you could 
definitely play, play in your team etc etc then when that was no longer an issue i remember later on in the 90s they came across a very good juventus team um who always seemed to have the upper hand but eventually they grew as a team um and, and they not just the players but also probably sir alex and um you know they, they won it in, in in 99 now i look at us and i think not just our Champions League form, our Europa League form hasn't been great, um, particularly away from home um, in in the sort of knockout st- st- stages. I think there was at one point you had to go back that that famous win in the San Siro that you mentioned against Milan, um, which was what 2011, mm-hmm. to and it, it had been a while since we got a victory um, in in the in the knockout yeah. st- st- stages away from home. But I look at us now. First season in the Champions League, we weren't all, all that. Um, last season, we were fantastic in the, in the, in the group stages, um, but got got knocked out um, to Juve. This season, um, it's it's slightly different. We've we've qualified, which is the main thing. We haven't won the group. We've had to be a bit dogged and, and um, determined and, and do it on the back of what wasn't a great start. Albeit, I think I think we were superb in the, in the first match um, against Inter. Um, and I think that's all part of the learning curve, and I, th- I think all of that will allow us to be better placed come the last sixteen to hopefully go a little bit further or a little bit further still. But as you said earlier, a lot of that's going to come down to players, what what form we're in at that point in time, or, or the opposition that that we, that we face, um, injuries, etc. Will all come into it. I. I quite like playing teams that we haven't played before in, in Europe yeah. recently. You want new experiences, new yeah. opportunities to, to you know countries to visit and you know new rivalries to uh, to start. So the obvious one would be PSG, um, particularly Pochettino's one of one of his former clubs, uh, Porto. You mentioned earlier um, that conjures up memories of our Cup Winners' Cup campaign um, back in what was it ninety one, ninety two? Yeah, season. Um, Certainly haven't played Bayern since the 80s when I would have uh, first started going to European nights. Yeah, Bayern's Bayern's another another good one. I happen to be, just coincidentally, I happen to be um, scheduled to go to Germany um, for work the the, the very week that we might well play them um, away from home. So I'm I'm keeping my fingers crossed that that we draw them because then that's hotel and um, flight sorted, just a question of getting a ticket. But um, yeah, whoever we get, it's going to be it'll be it'll be difficult but like you said I, I don't think that I think a lot of teams will won't want to play us either um let's bring it to yesterday Burnley um we've got a few comments and questions from from listeners so I'll, I'll go for a few of them um Rob Craxford only nine behind the wall um well we've won that's all that counts Kent Goodrich waiting for the Burnley manager players fans to moan about how they deserve something today um, if your plan is to stick nine men behind the ball, waste time and pray f- for nil-nil, um, you deserve t- to concede a late goal and get nothing but a long ride home empty-handed. Um, it was one of those frustrating days yesterday um, at Wembley. Um, we huffed and we puffed and eventually we got we got the three points. Um, at one point I felt this was it, this was going to be the, 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 the game the way we would um, finally... Um, Get a draw because we yes. is it 21, 21 matches if you include the t- tail end of last season yeah, that we've yeah. either won or or lost but but no draws um, and it felt like that and uh, we left it late but but we got the result. And I think it's a little disingenuous from from some people to to be so critical. What are Burnley expected to do if they come and pl- try and play an expansive open game? That's not their style, and we would most likely punish them you know, time and time again. So I don't quite understand why people... It's frustrating, I understand that. Um, but they crafted a couple of chances. I mean, Ashley Barnes could have scored twice right. and we could have looked very foolish. They did something similar last season with, you know, their smash and grab getting the equaliser with Chris Wood. So I just, you know, football's a, a different game every week. You, they, your opponents are different and you have to do different things. I mean, what I took from yesterday's game was... The, the centre-halves had to be our playmakers, really, because there was no space for the people further forward. There was absolutely nowhere. And, and all I kept seeing was, you know, Toby bringing the ball forward and passing the ball. And, and actually, we did go long quite a lot because we had to. There was no space. There was nowhere to play. Um, there was certainly no way to get in behind them. 
Um, you know, it's like when we beat Wigan 9-1, if, you know, all those years ago. Teams after that came and were tight and shut us down and, and, and got results because of how Wigan played that day. And we never learned from that. We never managed to break teams down. We'd lose to, you know, games against sides like Wolves because they'd hit us on the counter and they'd get one and we just couldn't break certain time teams down. But this Tottenham team have got a resilience. This, again, Pochettino with his substitutions were able to make changes. Do you know what most made such a difference this time is bringing Lorente on and using him. Last season when we brought him on, we never seemed to cross the ball. or We always seemed to take the people who have been crossing the ball that day off for Lorente. Now we get the ball in the box airily and he's able to chest or nod it down. And we've got goals because of that, PSV and now yesterday. And I, you know, I, I've got admiration for our ability to stick at things and our just desire. I mean, Kane celebrated that, you know, like it was his goal. Um, it meant that much to him. You know, I just thought it was a fantastic uh, finale. Obviously, it's come very, very late in the day. Um, and, you know, there'll be those who say we deserved it because we tried to win the game. We tried. There's merit in keeping a clean sheet. And Burnley kept, you know, kept us at bay for a long time. Mm. You mentioned um, playing out of the back and, and, and Toby, um, obviously, the, one of the chances that come, come to mind was when he... Sprayed it long to Lamella. I think Lamella took it on the half turn and then and passed it to Mora, who who yeah. went through. Um, that was a, that was a good chance. Um, at the back, we we obviously had injuries to uh, Foyt yes. and Sanchez and Yan. I'm not sure what the situation with Yan is. I hope he's back, obviously for for Wednesday. But it meant that Ben Davis started at the back. What, what do you make of his performance? Because I, I thought he had a decent game. I did too. I mean, his experience of playing centre half is very much in international football and playing as part of a back three, which again is very different, um, especially the pace of European football compared to the Premier League. It's worked in our favour in that it was a game where the opponent really didn't come at us at all. So if you could have cherry-picked a game where you had to do this, you probably would have gone with this set of circumstances. But, you know, Ben Davis is a sound player. He's probably, his weaknesses that people gripe at him is he's going forward when he's, you're comparing him to Danny Rose when they are, although they play in the same position, they play it very differently. Mm. Rose is definitely more of a wing-back um, and Davis is more of a full-back. So the defensive side of things, I would never really have worried it was just more about being on the inside rather than on the, you know, the outside at the side of the pitch. Um, but I thought he coped admirably within the situation. Absolutely, and it, it also shows the strength and depth and, and the versatility of, of the squad that we've got players that can play definitely in different positions. Um, it also see. helped with him being a left footer that Toby was able to be on his natural side. Um, if Toby's played with with Foyth, Toby's always switched to the left. Yeah, and he always seems a little bit more uncertain there. Obviously, if you've got a youngster inside, you want to make it as comfortable for him as possible. But there's an argument to say why are you changing the position of your best defender when he's the better one, Alvarez. But um, no, it was it was a sound performance. Um, and like I say, if you could have cherry picked which game to have to do this in, then then that would have been it. But Di- Di- when was the news come out about Dyer having? Uh, so so head- that was earlier to- earlier today. Spurs right. tweet- tweeted it. So he's 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 out with a. Um, appendix. Um, he's, uh, he's just just had an appendix up, so he, they, they say he'll be back in training in the new year, and that's yeah. going to be quite quite a bit of a blow, particularly when you consider the the midfield that we've got. Obviously, Dyer's out now, and Dembele I think is out of the new year. Wanyama is recovering. Um, who knows when he's going to be sort of match fully? And if he fit. comes back, is he the same player that we had? Yeah, that's. I don't think he's been the same player that we've had for for for, for quite a while, arguably, which means that that puts a lot of pressure on. Sissoko and Winks, um, who are fine. I've, I've got every faith in those two players, but doesn't leave us, leave us with many other options other than Mr. Oliver Skip, who exactly. um, played yesterday. Um, what did you make of his performance? I thought he was very sound. I mean, it's, again, it's a hard game to come into as the, the defensive midfield uh, player when there isn't so much to stamp out. So he's probably had a, uh, a more comfortable game than had he had a bigger opponent and had to come in for that. But, you know, Poch has, has done this now. 13 academy players have started under Poch uh, in, in, you know, in Poch's 169 games. And, and that's good credit to, to him because if you're good enough, he'll play you. If you're better than the options we've got, he's not going to play somebody out of position. I mean, you, you could have played Ericsson deep in central midfield, but he doesn't do the role that you would have asked Oliver Skip to play. So, 
Um, I, you know, I thought he was he was sound and did everything that was expected of him, um, and he'll, he'll grow confident from that. And we're definitely going to have to use him in games because they're going to come thick and fast. So we play every three or four days now. Yeah. Um, until well, well into January. It's not just you know until the end of the year. Then you've got Cardiff New Year's Day and the FA Cup, and then you know it just keeps on coming. It's thick and fast. So. I think that uh, um, he he definitely grew um, as, as as the game went um, went went on. I think there was, there was possibly a, a slight mistake he might have made fairly early on, where I think he lost the ball. But certainly second half, I felt that he was more assertive, and he wasn't just sort of doing the simple things and and which are important, picking up the ball. And, and, sorry, go on. It's always con- you know, it depends on the context of the mistake. On on Tuesday, Carl Walker Peters makes a slight mistake, and because Dembele is so so quick, he's made and able to you know to to get through and score the goal. Then it, you know we we say our oh, Walker Peters has made a blooper there. Mm. Luis made a horrific error, probably the worst goalkeeping error in modern times in the World Cup final. But nobody remembers it because they they, they were four one up and they won the game. Whereas you know two weeks before, three weeks before, Carrius makes. The mistake that costs Liverpool the Champions League, and his career is as good as finished for it. So it's all about context. For me, um, no, I agree totally. Yeah, and and uh, as you say, if, if if some of those mistakes prove to be cost costly, it, it magnifies the problem. Yeah, um, or the mistake even more. Um, right, we've got a few more um, around Burnley. I'll just quickly go uh, sorry, around Burnley. Should I say their? Um, their anti-football, if you if you want to call it that, um, uh, style. Um, Dominic Sibley, his Twitter handle is at Dom Sib. Is it more enjoyable to get a last-minute winner against a negative time-wasting team, or to win a game like today's three um, nil? Lee Marston, his Twitter handle is at Lee Marston eighty one. Is anything better than scoring a late goal against an anti-football team who wastes time from the first minute? And then John Steggles um, says Burnley got there just. Desserts as an anti-footballing side, um, as I recall, time wasting from the off, horrible. Do the panel hope Burnley get relegated? So I, I, I'm before I bring bring you in, just just my thoughts on that. I'm 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 inclined to agree with what you said earlier. That what else are they supposed to do if they if they come against a top team? Um, are they expected expected to be to go out and be completely gun gun ho and then um, allow themselves to be ex- ex- exposed? Um, they're gonna shut up shop and 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 make it difficult and and try to grind out a result having said that i think as a fan when you're sitting there watching it and you're watching all the time wasting antics it's very frustrating i agree 100 percent. but you know the referee will allow them a certain amount and, and we can do stuff to prevent them we can go and get the ball back for them or we can highlight it to the referee i'm not saying going moaning and whinging but you know they'll they'll stretch it as far as they can and Again, sometimes we're not too wise to this. Um, you know, you can do a lot in, your, in yourself to prevent this. And, you know, we don't seem to do that. We don't, you know, seem to make a fuss about it. And, and referees, I, I find it very frustrating. I'm a referee myself and I'm always on it. But then I'm a referee at parks level where I can communicate to people shouting at them from the halfway line to the goal, you know, to the goalkeeper. In the Premier League, you can't be heard from that distance. So it's, it's harder to get your message over. But... Um, you know, a team will stretch it as far as they can. As for them getting relegated, the three worst teams should be relegated. And, you know, that's what the league table is there for. Um, as for, yes, it is more satisfying to score a last minute winner like that. Um, but it's very easy to say that in hindsight. You know, you'd much rather be 3 0 up with, you know, as the, the board goes up with four minutes to go rather than being there 0 0 biting your nails. Great. Um... And is, is is there more satisfaction in 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 getting that late goal against a team that that makes it difficult as opposed to I don't know beating them three nil or four nil? I mean, I think there is definitely because it, they are not allowed the opportunity then to come back because of kind of what they've done or they've you know they've they've got to try and change the game in the last minute and make a substitution and and you know and try and catch you out. But yes, of course, it's it's the best time to score your winning goal in the last minute, but. Obviously, everyone would rather be have the game won and in the bag. But mm. it, again, you, you're talking in hindsight, and of course, we've got the three points, and that's all that matters. You know, there there used to be a saying 
you know, performances like this are the performance of champions. You know, they'll, that's probably an old school thing where you didn't have teams like Man City who could score 100 points and where every player's on nigh on £200,000 a week and costs £50 million. But <laughs> the landscape has changed slightly. But, you know, that's, that's a result Tottenham wouldn't have got very definitely in the past. And it's an improvement on last season where we only drew at home to Burnley at Wembley. Absolutely. Um, we had a, another comment from Kent Goodrich. He says, a year ago, we don't win that match, which shows the progression we've made. We, we've learned to win ugly, which is huge. Um, question from David Fornell. His Twitter handle is at Fornell. How well has Mr. Pochettino managed the squad in the last four games? I think magnificently. He's got a great grasp on it. I mean, a lot of the injuries are kind of just forcing his hand, especially with the back four. Um, you know, he's just picking who's available. Um you do people will say we should have strengthened the squad if we'd have strengthened the squad until now a lot of players wouldn't have had the football they wouldn't have had the opportunities Sissoko might not have played as often or as well as he has if we'd have bought another central midfielder so you know I think the, the management of the squad has been amazing this next month is going to be critical though because of how thick and fast the games come and because how little chance we'll have to rest people um, because you know, we're struggling for bodies now. And like you said, there's a lot of people out to the new year. Absolutely. Um, a few stats from yesterday. I know you like your stats. Um, John Steckles, Christian Eriksen strike yesterday was the first 90, 90th, the first winning goal for us. In stoppage time from open play in a home league match since March 2014. I think if you, wow. um, in stoppage time away from home, you've got to go back to Swansea, April 2017, when Son got yeah. a winner. Um, he also goes on to say, Eric's now. Then we got now... as well, didn't we? Sorry? We, we won, went 2 1, then 3 1 in that. 3 1, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then he goes on to say, Ericsson has now scored as many Premier League goals, 42 for Spurs, as Gareth Bale has. <laughs> um, He's also joint fifth in the top scorers list. Um, the only thing I'd say with that is um, Bale, I think, did it in less games um, than Christian Eriksen. Yeah, I mean, Bale... a bit more of a dynamic player, and we certainly had a season where we were more reliant on him than, than we've ever been on Eriksen. I mean, the stat about no home winning goals in stoppage time since 2014, we've won more games since 2014 before the, that time already than we'd had yep. in previous years. Um, you know, when you're struggling, you do sometimes need those late ones. But actually, our home form has been incredible, hasn't it? For, if you think the last season in the Premier, in the Premier League at Waha Lane, we were unbeaten. Um, what have we lost? Only four league games at Wembley? Is that right? Uh, this Chelsea, season? Or? Chelsea, no, since we've been there. Chelsea, since we've been there. Man Chelsea, City, twice and Man City twice and Liverpool, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's no disgrace in those teams that we've even lost to. We've certainly struggled in the past with with teams there or there around us, you know, in the middle of the table, and, and occasionally with teams near the bottom. Mm. Just out of interest, Bale did it in in a six year spell with us from 2007 to 2013, but that was in 146 games, 42 yeah. goals. Um, Ericsson since 2013 to now, so that's five and a bit years, so slightly less time, but. It took him 185 um, games to do it, but different yeah. players, different yeah. players, different positions. And, you know, Bale had quite a long time out injured, didn't he? When he got um, Charlie yeah. Adams, one of the, one of the many Charlie Adams assaults on him. Absolutely, but it's, it's, nonetheless, it, it, it's it's impressive that Ericsson's up there, Definitely. Um, joint fifth in the top scorers list. I'm not sure if John uh, means joint fifth this season um, overall, or yeah, I think it's... Um, that's not too bad. Okay. Uh, let, a couple more questions. Um, another one around time wasting. Dominic Sibley again at Dom Sibley's Twitter handle is with, with time wasting. What do you think, refs? What, with time wasting, do you think that refs should stamp down on it with yellow cards in, in early games like today's or yesterday's even, or is it just football game management? Now you, you've yeah, I mean, re- refereed. It was quite early, wasn't it? It was around the hour mark when we first. We first saw it. I mean, it's good that the referee's wise to it. I just think they could be more proactive. Mm. Um, but like I say, you know, the Tottenham could be more proactive. The players, the ball boys, everyone just be more alert to it. Um, it probably comes down from, from the management and making sure that we are aware that this is likely to be part of the opposition's, um, you know, demeanour. But if we go and get the ball for them when it goes out for a goal kick, 
I mean, nine times out of ten, there's, there's a ball boy next to it anyway, and it's going to come back to them quickly. But don't give them the opportunity to stop the game and slow it down. Highlight that everything's ready to play. Let's go. And then they, they can't delay it any longer. Um, but, yeah, it's down to the referees, and some are hotter on it than others. Um, final question from one of our listeners. Um Tom Hotspur family podcast very own Bex Rebecca Braddock um, she asks how do I get a hat like the one Potch and the rest of the coaching staff had so they're all wearing bubble hats or beanies uh, whatever the correct terminology is they're purple hats black and purple Sp- weren't they yeah, yeah. and I, I looked I looked in the Spurs shop online and I couldn't see them unless they are exclusive to the actual new Spurs store or, or maybe they're exclusive to the staff I, I, I don't know but um, they seem quite fetching there's unlikely to be anything that isn't for sale in, in the Tottenham marketing, you know, department. Don't usually allow that. I wouldn't have thought personally, but um, yeah, it's it's you, you know, you, it was cold, cold day and rainy day yesterday, and nobody dare use a brolly at Wembley, do they? Because you just the, the connotations are just too bad. <laughs> With dear old Steve McCarron, yeah. That's right. If we'd have won the game, of course, it wouldn't have been an issue back then against Croatia, but. All it's going to take is if you're three or four nil up, let's just break the curse and someone whip out a brolly if need be. <laughs> that would be good. Um, right. Um, I should, should say because of Christmas and, and all that, there won't be a podcast next week. The, the next one will be in a fortnight. So there are quite a few games from now to um, the next pod in two weeks' time. So we've got Woolwich up next in the Cup and then... Um, a series of away games, Everton away next Sunday, and then Bournemouth and Wolves at home. Um, how do you see these games? Can we win all of them? Do you think we will? I'd be more confident about the league games. Um, I don't know why. I've just got this sense of doom about Wednesday. I just I fancy that it might be a struggle again. Um, we, we can't. Well, we haven't got that many people to rotate actually, so we, mm. we may not see. Um, so many people. I'd like to see us put the first team out, get a game one. I'm not saying we're going to, you know, go to Arsenal and be three 0 up and be able to take players off and rest them. But if if you've got to play a weakened team, let's let's get the job done first and then tell players that right, you know, you'll get off after 70 minutes if we're comfortable, and let's manage it from there. But you know, I don't think we have the strength in certain positions at the moment to yeah. be able to do that. I think much will depend on Jan whether he is. I don't, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know why he didn't play yesterday. Well, it's it's Sanchez rested. back in training as well now. So he's closer than he, we thought he was going to be out until mm. January. But, um, yeah, you know, it, it is what it is. That they, they might not go full strength. I'm sure there'll be a, a blend of of youth and experience. Um, it pretty much depends on what happens on the day in one of these cup matches, the League Cup now. Um, it's, a, it's a trophy we could win, and I don't understand why anybody would would sooner not be part of it. Um, it would congest January with another two-legged um, tie in January, but you know, let's deal with that then if we do get there. Um, a, a two-legged tie, which no doubt won't be um, at Wembley. Sorry, it won't be at the, at, the, at the new stadium even. That's it, exactly. So depending on who who it is, I mean, if it's someone big, then obviously they'd try and use Wembley. But again, mm. if it if we happen to pull out someone who's not deemed as sexy a tie. Um, at Wembley, you do wonder whether they'd move it again to uh, to Stadium NK. Yeah, I think um, I don't know. I, I fancy us on 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 Wednesday on the basis that I think we, we're the better team. Although credit pains me to say it's credit credit to them when they played us a fortnight ago. That they were the better, better side on the day. But um, I think we will learn any lessons from that day. And I think as long as Jan is back and we've got Jan and Toby at the back. Um, I, there aren't many options to rotate in the centre of the park. I suspect he'll go for Winks and Sissoko. And I think further forward, I think it will be Ericsson and Son starting, as they didn't start yesterday, with Delhi and Ericsson. Um, full backs, who knows? Who, who, it's very difficult to second guess Poch. Yeah. Um, in goal, um, I don't know who, who, who again, who, who I, he'll I, go for. I reckon he'll go for Gazaniga, personally. Mm. I, I wouldn't have any problem with that. He's not put a foot foot, foot wrong. No. I've, I've got to say, no, not at all. Um, I know when he when um, Lloris was going through a difficult spell, and then Vaughan came in, and Vaughan maybe didn't fill many people with, with confidence. A lot of fans were there was a big clamour to, to to 
give Gazaniga a chance. And at that time, I wasn't completely enthusiastic about it because we'd only seen Gazaniga once against Palace last season. And yeah. he, played, he played well and he, he, he did okay in, in, a, in a pre-season friendly as well. But I didn't think there, there was enough there to, to make a judgment one or the other. But he's, he's played a few games for us since... Um, this season, and I think every time he's played, he's done the things, the basic things that you'd want from a goalkeeper. He's looked solid. He's also looked good with his kicking on the ball. So um, I'd be fine if, if 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 he if he played. Although, of course, if he if if he if he started and Hugo was put on the bench, I could see many Spurs fans then being critical and saying, "Oh, Pochettino doesn't play his strongest team, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. But um, yeah, that's certainly a. A difficult tie, but um, as for the league games, Everton, Bournemouth, and, and Wolves, maximum points. You hope so. I mean, we, we've got a kind of iffy record up at Goodison. We, we've often struggled there, but then often done well at home against them. Um, you know, we, we just got to go and do the business. Um, if everyone's firing, I mean, what was it a Kane hat trick? Was that two seasons ago at Goodison? Earlier on in the season, I remember yep. it being a sun drenched day. Yeah, I cannot for the life of me think what what last season's game was at, at Goodison. Uh, I think we won, I believe, and I think that that, that was the one where where Kane took a shot from a sort of cross shot or cross come shot from from distance, and it loops in. Yes, that's right. Yeah, uh, a, a more recent record is better than um, than it's been, but yeah, I mean, uh, we, there's definitely no reason why we can't. We just got to go and do the job on the day. Yeah, absolutely. That kind of applies always, really. Okay, in the second half of the podcast, we will discuss the Spurs shirt book. Um, But before we do, here is Bex with this week's Spurs Ladies update. Hiya, it's Bex. So the girls played mid-week, sorry, against Chelsea in the Conti Cup and lost 5-0. It's not a great result for them, obviously, that nobody's happy to lose 5-0. But considering that Chelsea are in a league above them, eh, meh. And it's not the first time we've been beaten. The Conti Cup is a round-robin game, kind of like the early stages of... Similarly, the Champions League. Um, so, a little bit disappointing, a bit meh, but anyway, they're done for this year. On a league front, that leaves them fourth in the league, which sounds a bit crap, but it's not actually. It's really, really good. We're one point off the top, which is Man United, which is a team of top-level players that's been pulled together by money. Sounds like Man City, oddly. Um, and the gap between us in fourth and London Bees in fifth is nine points, so that's quite considerable, and it shows that we are really pulling our weight, and we're, the girls are doing really well. So as I mentioned, the girls don't play again this year. They don't, their next game is on Sunday, the 6th of January, and that's away at Chef United. So anybody that's up that part of the northern world, um, definitely go and have a look. It's at Bramall Lane, and that's a two o'clock kickoff. It should be quite good, and that's back in the league. So hopefully the girls will have a nice break over Christmas, and everybody will be feeling refreshed for that game then. Okay, if you have any questions, I am on Twitter at Bunches Bex. Cheers, bye-bye. Welcome back to the second half of the Tom Hotspur family podcast. Thank you, Bex. Right, um, we'll talk about Spurs shirt book, but briefly, um, as I said at the outset, listeners will, will know you as Stato from the Echoes of Glory podcast. Um, if you don't already listen to the Echoes of Glory podcast, then do give it a listen. Fantastic pod, podcast um, with, with yourself, um, ASD, Jack, um, where can listeners, if they want to listen to that podcast, how and where can they um, download well, it? Um, all your usual uh, podcast catchers, I guess, but we're um, we're on Audio Boom, um, so uh, if that's your your place where you go and get them, but I, I get them through iTunes, as I'm sure uh, lots of people do, um, and it's at underscore Echoes of Glory on Twitter. If you've got anything to say to us, and we'll happily chat away with fans uh, of Tottenham and all the pod. Excellent. Okay, um, the Spurs shirt book. So this is a book which is um, essentially the official history of the Tottenham Hotspur jersey, which yes, yeah, has been it. written by um, Simon Shake, Sh- Shake Shaft, Darren Burney and Neville Evans. And you worked as a researcher on the book. I did, that's right. Um, this is something that Simon Shake Shaft um, essentially has pulled all of this together. Uh, and Darren Burney and Neville Evans are football shirt collectors of, of match worn shirts um, and, and their shirts probably make up 80% of, of the shirts photographed for this book. Um, there's 209 different variations of shirt in the book. Um, I think it's probably best to explain it's a coffee table book, so it's quite large. It's a big square book. 
um, and it's 300 odd pages um, and it's just a beautiful illustrated well, photographic history um, of the Spurs shirt and, and the story behind each of those individual jerseys and the players who've worn them. I think there's 120 odd players uh, represented from the great and the good. Um, all of our heroes, all of, of, of the heroes of yesteryear. Um, and then for one shirt, that was the only example we could find. We've got, uh, was it Massimo Lunga? Uh, the chap who missed a penalty in his only appearance against Stoke in the League Cup tie in the I don't know, early 2010, something like that. Um, but it's the only available um, one of that specific shirt. So it's made it into the book, mm. uh, even though that was his only one and only game. And I can understand why he didn't necessarily want to keep his shirt from that as a memory. But uh, And whose idea was it to, to, to come up with this? Because as, as a book, I mean, the thing that I really like about it, I've got a copy right here, um, which I purchased um uh, a week before last, um, and it's a fantastic book. And and <laughs> look, there are so many, so many football books out there. There are so many Spurs books, but the thing I love about this one, it's not your typical, I don't know, history of, of Spurs or which, which there are countless um, uh, books like that. It, 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 it's quite, u- it's it's unique. I mean, you get books about stadium, uh, White Hart Lane, that that's fine. But this is just something that's a unique. Um, it's really well put together. It's um, it's just a, be- a beautiful design, but it's a unique concept. I think that that's the the thing that that that's, that stands out for me with with the book. And there's actually been a few other clubs that have produced them, not necessarily to this high standard, um, but certainly there've been, there've been a few in the last couple of years. It's certainly um, kit history has certainly become a little niche market. Um, there are now pop up shops coming around, and, and there are online places where you can go and buy your favourite nostalgic shirt from yesteryear. People are picking up old stock from warehouses, boxes that have been left, you know, dust covered for years and years. And all of a sudden they're finding classic, classic shirts and, and people are selling them and people are buying them more importantly. And, and, and kit chat has become quite a thing. I mean, it's something that's always interested me. Um, there's been a few books in the past of illustrations of kit. So graphic designer types have, have done their interpretations of the shirts, but Actually, photographing the shirts is, is quite a newish thing. Um, Simon's done a, a book of this nature before um, for a, for another club that aren't too far away from us that, that once came from South London. Um, he's not a Tottenham fan. He's also not a Woolwich fan. Um, but he is the kind of go-to man for questions about match-worn shirts. Um, so you've got players who are looking to to sort of you know sell their their collection of match-worn shirts as a sort of top up to their pensions. Um, they come to him for information about the shirts that they've got. And he's this encyclopedic knowledge of match-worn shirts. I mean, he could date a shirt just by the, the font on the number in the back of the shirt or something like that. Um, so he's helped lots of players because there's more credence when you when you try and sell a shirt rather than say, oh, it was a 1970s England shirt. If you can say it was a 1972 game where England beat you know Spain or Brazil or whomever, um, and, and he can be that specific as though the provenance of the shirt gives it gives it its value. And, and the shirts in this book, um, are, some of them are very, very valuable. I mean, we've got every home shirt from 1960 onwards and every away shirt from 71 onwards um, with all the chain shirts, all the third shirts. That's quite a it seems to be a new phenomenon to us. But actually in the 60, 61 season, Spurs wore yellow in one fixture. Um, and in the 1977, we wore all royal blue, very much not a Spurs colour, um, away at Ellen Road, and that's the only one missing in that timeline of, of away shirts from 71 onwards. Um, and it was only worn the once by the first team uh, and once by the youth team. So unfortunately, none of those have survived. Um, but, but a lot of these shirts are pride of place in people's collections. Um Briefly to go off on a slight tangent, tangent. Arsenal have scored. So sorry, oh. uh, Southam- Southampton have scored even um, three two. Um, hopefully they can they can hold on there. Um, you're a researcher on the book. How, how did how did that come about? How, how did you get involved? Um, There's always been a little niche of people who sort of know each other. A few kit podcasts, and I've been a guest on a couple of those. Just literally through Facebook groups and talk on Twitter about kits. Um, sometimes fantasy kits that you, you know designers have, have made up. People have said, "Oh, wouldn't the Spurs kit look good 
but using a different you know kit manufacturer we've never had you know let's say uh i'm trying to think of an example maybe adidas in the the early 80s you know much before we had them so you know somebody would have designed them and and you know i just always commented or if people had questions about kits um i'd quite often know stuff because i've kind of been obsessed with this since i was a kid um all of my homework books would have probably had you know drawings of kit designs in the back somewhere um, sadly not art and design it would have always been the wrong subject and I probably got told off for it but um, you know I always wanted felt tip pens or color pencils to, to to draw kits so it's kind of been an obsession and people I'm at school with who found out that I did this were like, oh my god you were born to do that but I rather suspect there are lots of people who would have loved to have been part of it and have probably have an equal claim to me but uh, I was lucky enough to get noticed by by Mr. Shakeshaft Shakey as he's better known um, on Facebook and Twitter and how, how long, two questions really, how long did it, um, did you spend working on the book and, and how long did it take for the authors to put the book together? It's uh, actually from... taken two and a half years. We, we had aimed to be out this time last year, in, in time for Christmas last year. Um, that didn't happen due to um, health issues for, for someone who was a key part of this. Um, but as he, they positively say, it's a better book for the delay. We've managed to fill a couple of the gaps that we had of shirts that have subsequently been found. Um, we've also managed to get this season's kits in where we wouldn't have had the opportunity last season. Um, I don't think we wore the purple third or European kit until too late in the season for us to have included it last year. And because our, you know, the thing about the book is these are match-worn shirts, we, we couldn't have broken the rules even just for one shirt. So uh, it's now a more complete book for that delay but we've, we've been working on it for, for two and a half years and if you ask my wife I spent too long working on it <laughs> uh, if you ask me every moment of it was just a pleasure I mean my role the, the crux of it the first part I did was I've tried to record every kit we've worn in every game since 1977 we've kind of taken that as the modern era uh, from when Spurs wore Admiral kit the first um, sort of you know commercially available shirt in the club shop um, one of the other researchers um, has kind of covered everything before. So you could say I got lucky um, only having to do the last 40 odd years and an era where photography has been that much more available. Colour has been more more available. And then the godsend has been the Internet. Um, mm. So, you know, I've just spent hours reading books, programmes and watching anything that anyone's uploaded on YouTube. So. It was hardly a chore. It was just an absolute dream to be part. I was, was going to say, it must have been an absolute joy working on the book. Um, are there any any new things that you've learnt about Spurs from researching? Any interesting stories or facts behind the shirts that you can reveal? I know there are probably countless ones. And, and, yeah, I mean, just and, little, little things like the perception. Spurs and QPR both changed to their away kits in '82, and the. The, the rule used to be that if there was a clash, both teams would change, but that had this long... Is the 82 Cup final. That's right. Um, yep. But this had long changed, and in fact, QPR won the toss, um, so Tottenham had to change, but then QPR chose to wear their away kit because they'd won in the semi-final in it. Um, so Spurs you know, wore yellow for that reason, and QPR chose to wear red, and in fact, it happened for a few Cup finals before that. Um but little, little things like that. Um, Spurs have worn a third kit in 1960. That wasn't something that we thought, uh, or I certainly didn't know before now. Is there a favourite, I mean, home shirt or away shirt that you've, that, 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 that well, w- 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 I suppose, what is your favourite home and, 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 and away shirt? It might be that through researching this book, that there's one that you perhaps weren't aware of that, that's, that suddenly become your favourite? Is there one that stands out for you? I think it's always been my favourite, and it would actually be the, the first Holston shirt. So with the central crest, um, Lecoq Sportif badge on each sleeve, and the shadow stripe, and the, the Holston word in bold. Um, there are lots of people who say that sponsorship spoils football shirts. Um, I think in its place, I think it's a good thing. It's part of the shirt. It gives you balance with the colours usually. Um, obviously, there are lots of people who are anti um, Tottenham having a red sponsor now. now I, I do understand that, but you know, we live in a world where if someone's willing to pay us twice as much as another company and their corporate logo is red, then unfortunately we know we're mm. going to take that. Um, so, you know, that, that's part and parcel of it. But that ain't Never... with a shadow stripe. So it's white yeah. from afar, but you look up close and it's kind of got a shiny side to it. And um, 
you know a more plain stripe to it as well. Now, was that eighty six, eighty seven, or was it before then? No, before then. So we're not looking at the Hummel one with the chevrons. Uh, yeah, would have been you know white shirts, navy shorts, and white socks. Mm. Um, the same design as the centenary kit, but just with the badges slightly changed. And it was with the first one that had Holston on it when, when Holston became our sponsor in late eighty three. And is there a favourite away shirt? I'm for me, yellow is the Tottenham away colour. Um, I know it's not agree. always been the case. Um, but that 82 FA Cup final shirt, there was just something about that. Um, I, I don't, I can't think of any other team who've just got sort of navy or whatever colour epaulettes sort of on the shoulder, um, just for that slight breaking up of the colour. Um, I love that it had the same colour cuffs and, and collar, so they were non-contrasting. I like that. Lots of teams would have gone for you know alternate colour on that, um, and I just it was shiny and striking. And I was six or seven, and you know it's. It's just a very fond memory. I didn't even own that one, actually. I had the home shirt back then, but it, that's probably my favourite. I'm Yeah, I agree with you. But for, for, for me, the away shirts, they've got to be what I consider traditional colour. So I, I like the the yellow that we bought, would have worn in 82 or, or um, the yellow design that we wore, say, late 80s, early, early 90s. Yeah, the Hummel. Hummel. You're thinking of Gasso, aren't you? I, yeah, for that. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, then we had Umbro after that. That had a little bit too much going on. Um, sort of ninety one, ninety two. Um, yeah. The 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 pattern on the on the shoulder. A little little bit. So I, I like a simplistic look. So for for me, a, a, an all yellow, light blue. I'm okay with that. Yeah. That kind of just up certain memories or. Or well, the dark blue um, kit. The, I've I've got a retro one of those, a '63 or '61. Okay, yeah, I've got the period. '70s one, the one with the, the more modern crest than, than you've got probably. But um, yeah, that's a firm favourite of mine. And the navy is very much actually the traditional colours because they used to be your reverse colours pretty much, um, except for clubs who had stripes or the like. Um, you, you pretty much wore an alternate, you know, the the swapping of what you had for your home kit. Um, I'd probably say if you had to ask what was the best set of kits, I'd go back to 2004, 2005, where we had very, very plain Kappa uh, kits. So it was white and blue home sh- or home shirt and shorts, navy away shirt with white shorts, and then all yellow. And if we had to sort of date that, then I'd say that was Timothy Atuba in the yellow. Mm-hmm. If you can remember him, that would have been about the only kit he wore. <laughs> and lacing one in against Newcastle. But that home kit, it was interesting, it was the last time we had a home shirt for two seasons. Ever since 2005-06, we've had a new home shirt every season. I was going to say, I, I remember um, I'm a few years, only, only a few years younger than, than yourself, so I, I, I started following Spurs uh, around about 1990. Uh-huh. I, remember, I remember at that point, um, football kits in general, whether that was a Spurs kit or an England kit, um, it would... Two, maybe three. That could be, yeah. that could be, that could be my, 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 my mind playing tricks on me before it was changed. Certainly, the home kit, away kits, maybe a bit more frequent. Yeah. Now, now it's every every season you get a, a, a home, away, and a third kit. And if you're, a, I mean, you're a parent. If you if you're a parent and you've got kids, there's going to be that pressure every every year um, for, for, um, from your kids. So, you know, they want they want the new kit, and and it's. It, I just find it annoying. I understand. I understand the reasons why clubs do it, and and for marketing purposes, etc., and, and and the money that will bring in. But um, it would be nice if 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 a club had a kit for a couple of years, and you could say, right, that's a home kit, right, for that period of time, rather than every season. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's it's now part and parcel of the contract, and I don't necessarily think it's always the clubs that are driving it. It's probably the mm. manufacturers, actually, um, you know, that want that that turnover. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me now, I mean, I haven't bought a home shirt. I'm a man in my mid forties, probably not really into wearing football shirts that often. Um, I'd rather have a retro one because rather than it being last year's shirt or two years shirt to go, I'd rather wear one from the seventies and it just be a retro shirt. It's just a Spurs shirt. Um, but you know, it, be- it's own. the beauty of a retro shirt is timeless. I mean, it's, well, that's it. yeah. um, whereas you, you, you buy a shirt, this season shirt, it, Come whatever it is, nine months down the line or, or, or whatever, when, when, when the new season starts, um, it's it's dated. Um, yes, yeah. How do you feel about? I'm 
Just kind of starting off on a segue, but how, how do you feel about today's kits? Because I'm not a big fan of... I mean, the home kits are, are what they are, that, that, that's fine, but a lot of the away kits and the third, third kits, I'm, I'm not a big fan of colours like turquoise or... I mean, purple, I suppose, you associate with, with, with Klinsman, and we've had that a few times. Yeah. But, but we've, we've had some strange kits. The black kit a few years ago, there was a brown kit, which I, I thought was awful. I, I just don't I feel any of them... I really, really? Did. yeah no I, I was a big fan of that i had certainly got one still and i think i had another one um but there were problems with the badge kept flaking off and i had to send it back to puma to be reapplied um but yeah no i mean it's all horses for courses people have their own preferences and you know we can choose to to buy or not to buy them but yeah i mean nowadays the, the designs they have to turn over year after year after year and the bigger clubs want bespoke shirts um, I mean, Nike had the, the Vapor range where it just the shirt was always the same and the colours changed. Um, that would have been the year before we were with, with Nike, actually. But, you know, it's they have to change it so often that they do weird and wacky things like, I don't like this season shirt. I think it looks ridiculous in Europe as well with the graduated, you know, starting navy at the bottom, which yeah. was fine with the navy shorts. But, you know, I'll be honest, I'm surprised they didn't do a European shirt, a plainer one. But, uh, yeah, they, they, they seem to change for change's sake, unfortunately. Mm. But, uh, I'm, you know, it's only going to be one season. And if the, you're lucky, we won't win anything in it because you won't have to look at the photos of them for years and years and years. And <laughs> <laughs> the um, the 2004-05 kit that you referred to earlier, was that, was that Thompson? Was it Thompson? was, yeah. The one where they first they had their logo bigger as well as the wording. So I think previously they'd had Thompson and the logo all on one line. It was quite a bit smaller. Um, and it, and it, as I recall, um, if it's I don't know if it was that incarnation or, or just before it, it was a very skin tight shirt, and we'd gone yeah. from baggy baggy shirts in in the nineties. We should look back at it now, and they they look ridiculous at the time. It just seemed seemed normal. Well, it's not just we baggy suddenly... shirts. I mean, match worn shirts. If you compare them from the nineties, they're almost a third as big again. They're incredible. Mm. Um, how skin tight, but then players are you know a different shape now, aren't they? There's no body fat. Yeah. Uh, on these guys and you know you don't want you imagine can you remember raw fox trying to run down the wing in yeah, the yeah. Bad shirt? it was like he was carrying a parachute um <laughs> it, I, maybe he was quick he just was always just hampered by the pony uh and, and adidas equipment that he had on P- pony's an interesting one um i think that first first shirt that i bought was pony um 1995 um it's a manufacturer of the, of the time. You know, you had Umbro were a big player. Um, I don't think Nike had started to really get involved. Um, Umbro were the main one. You had Adidas. And then suddenly Pony. And I remember at the time purchasing a, a Pony kit and uh, at school a lot of um, a lot of friends who supported other teams were, 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 were sort of quite getting quite, quite a bit of stick from them because it was like, who are they? Um but it's an often forgot, forgotten about manufacturer. But we've pretty much had, I mean, we've had um, Homel, as you said, uh, um, Umbro, Adidas, Nike now, um, Pony, pretty much every single manufacturer. Yeah, yeah we've had all the big ones. There are were, were very few that, um, that you'd say we've missed out on. I mean, we had Umbro in the 60s and before people actually saw the, the manufacturer's logo on the shirt. Obviously, we were one of the first teams to go to Admiral. Um, but unfortunately, their their boom or well, they burst quite quickly, and we had to go to Le Coq Sportif, and I think they changed the market in, in shirts in, in the football league in 1980, um, going to a very much a shinier sort of polyester kit rather than the old style cloth shirts that look very dated very quickly. Um, but Spurs have always been quite groundbreaking in their shirts um, and their shorts. If you go back to the 91 Cup final, where Spurs changed actually for the final into a new kit with a new manufacturer. Um, we'd worn Hummel all season, but that contract had expired. Um, and then Spurs went to Umbro and, and we showcased these new baggy style of shorts that became, well, everyone still wears now. Mm. The, 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 the reds that you mentioned earlier, um, our sponsor at the moment, um, and uh, obviously we had Thompson a few, a few years ago. And, and, and I know that's always a cause of much outrage for some of our fans who refuse to buy a home kit on, on that basis but um, if fans don't already know and they'll certainly we'll, we'll, do, we'll, we'll become aware of, aware of this if they purchase and, and, and read the book um, many 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 years ago and I appreciate it's not um, uh, uh, era that you researched for the book but no doubt you're fully aware yeah. um, we, we, we wore red 
for five years. For five mm. years. I mean, that's quite a big, big change. Um, we were known as the Tottenham Reds back then, you know, locally and in, in the press. So it's not like you can afford to be snotty and say, oh, we, you know, we've never worn this. We have. It's It was also a change colour quite often mm. um, because necessity meant you just had to have utterly different colours that, that no one else had. But that's why Tottenham wore white. When Tottenham first yeah. had to register colours in the Southern League, um, no other team wore white, so so Spurs chose white because that was the common sense thing to do was to pick a kit. It's often been said that we followed the colours of Preston North End, who did, you know, were the Invincibles that time. They were the greatest team in the land, and we did follow suit with the same colours. But but actually, it was necessity more than anything um, that the the club chose to register white as, as their colours. The um. I was going to say um, the all whites that we that, that we wear um, now often you associate that with with with, with European nights. Yeah. Um, uh, certainly, I think post. I don't exactly know the exact date, whether it was sixty three or, or before that, but I think it uh, certainly under Bill, Bill Nick we 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 wear and to this day we wear all, all white. And as you said, with the current current kits. This season's offering it doesn't look great with the, with the blue bit at no. the bottom when, when you when you go with the white shorts. Um, there have been a few occasions, notably um, eighty six, eighty seven. Uh, more recently, I think the Santini the Under Armour. Oh, the, 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 we, we, well, yeah. we did it under Santini, and then more recently the the the, the uh, 2013 season with, with Bale, we, we wear an all wore an all all white kit. I'm. I, do you know what? I'm not a big fan of the all-white kit. I don't mind it. I don't mind it in Europe. I think I that's fine. Yeah. But I think that when you're playing the majority of your games, domestic games, um, for me, it's got to be white, blue, and then either white or blue socks. Yeah. And I mean, that, that's that's varied over different different seasons. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm not a big fan of the whole all-white kit unless it's European games. Um, the book. Um, where is it? If, if, if I, well, I've already purchased a copy, but if, but if, if listeners wanted to purchase a copy, where can they get, get it from? Um, how much does it cost? It's et cetera. exclusively available through Tottenham, so you can only get it at the club shop or outlet. So there's a branch in Stevenage, in Harlow, in Chelmsford. So it's available in all the club shops and at the club website. Um, I'm afraid if you try and get down to your local Waterstones or all good booksellers, um, they're not available there. It's only exclusively available through the club. Which is nice in itself. I mean, um, the the previous book that Shaky did uh, with the other lot, the, their club didn't want to know. They didn't really understand it. Um, but but when Tottenham saw their their version of the book, they said, "We want one of this." And now they've seen it, they are incredibly pleased with it. They are so happy, um, and and it's an official licensed, um, you know, Tottenham memorabilia now. Mm. And and. As you said, other other clubs have have, um, have got similar offerings, but as far as I know, from a Spurs perspective, it, it's it's unique. And uh, there was a, a pamphlet done a few years ago with about twenty shirts in um, that I'm afraid was riddled with errors, um, and uh, yeah, it was uh, incomparable to this uh, work of art. I mean, the photography for for these shirts is just incredible. You, you've you've got a copy of it yourself. If you, you, you can feel yeah. almost feel like you can touch the shirt. Mm. Um, it, you know, it's, it's sort of every other page is a photograph of the shirt, and you're looking at full page photographs for all the home shirts. And then only when it starts to become crazy with the you know three kits a season, um, do, do they start getting a bit smaller and, and the away shirts and the text is all on the same page. But um, no, I think it's a beautiful thing. I'm slightly jealous, um, but you know, I managed to to be lucky enough to be given a copy of it, um, which has saved me thirty pounds because I definitely would have bought one. I'd have probably bought two, one to keep pristine forever and never even touch and one to, to look at on a daily basis. But it's been a privilege to be part of it. And, and I was lucky enough to be at the photo shoots. So I've handled almost all of these shirts and sniffed them and, <laughs> you know, just felt the, the awesomeness of them and the and what had happened in them, the history and the players. And it was just an incredible thing to be part of. And 
it, for me, like it's certainly a, a a beautiful thing, and then, but it's also a must have for any Spurs fans. And uh, and at thirty pounds, I think it's thirty pounds well, well spent. So Christmas Christmas round the corner. If you're stuck for ideas, um, for loved ones um, who happen to be Spurs fans, or, or maybe they're not Spurs fans, but maybe they're Arsenal fans, and you want to wind the hell, hell up, <laughs> wind them up. No, um, if, if, they're, if they're Spurs fans, um, educate them. Yeah, if 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 you've got. Um, friends, family, siblings um, who are um, Spurs fans, then buy, this would make the perfect Christmas present or, or treat yourself. I mean, I, I went down to the Spurs shop the um, uh, week before last and um, it was great a, going down there um, to, to see the, the huge new shop. But um, yeah, there was loads of copies of, of this and uh, it's a really good read. Um, Arsenal, by the way, Southampton has finished 3-2. Hey, um, find the gap. Which, which leaves us five, still leaves us five points clear of, of, of Arsenal. Um, unfortunately, Chelsea beat Brighton 2 1, so they're just two points behind us. Um, finally, um, this is a question, it's a reoccurring question on the podcast that uh, that we ask all new guests this, this season. Um, it's from I know Alan Gilzean or, or Gilly. Um, his Twitter handle is that I know Alan Gilzean, and he asks, so the question is for you. Andy, which Spurs player would you like to travel to and sit with at an away game? I, th- I thought long and hard about this, and in honour of, of Shaky and my good friend ASD, two proud Welshmen, I think I would probably choose Cliff Jones as an all-time player. Um, he was my dad's favourite player, and I just love to listen to his stories of the double era um, and just try and learn so, as much as I can about Bill Nicholson and the time. But if you still see him and hear him talk about Tottenham, the enthusiasm he has for the modern uh, Tottenham and uh, the, the modern ways, he's not one of these older players who come across bitter at all. And, you know, it was better in our day. Um, but if I was to choose a, a player of the modern time, I think I'd probably, I think I'd get on with Ben Davis. I don't know why. I just think he's a sound guy, um, not flashy at all. Uh, I'm sure I might be the first person who's definitely answered him. I think uh, you are, yeah. But yeah, I think he's just a, a nice bloke, thoroughly good player, uh, much underrated and often maligned, and I don't think there's any real justification for it. I think he's he's very hard-working, and I think that's um, Pochettino likes that in a player. And whilst it's true this season, perhaps he hasn't hit, hit, hit the standards of last season, where, in fact, going forward, um, I think he created more chances than any other defender in the league last yeah. season. And th- this season, for whatever reason, he hasn't reached those, those standards. Um, but I, I thought at centre-back, in a, in a back four rather than in a, in a back three, where, where he plays uh, for Wales, I thought he was superb yesterday. I thought, I thought he handled, handled some himself very well and uh yeah uh, interesting choice yeah like you said i don't think, I don't think anybody else that's, that's appeared on the pod this season has has answered ben davis um so yeah good choice right um the next podcast um which we'll be recording um, won't be next weekend uh because christmas is sort of fairly close and the timing isn't great um so the next podcast will be two weeks today uh, my guest on that occasion hope i hope to have david fornell and jess nickel all that left for me to say is thank you Andy. Thank you, Javed. It's been a privilege. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who's appeared on the podcast um, this season. Um, this season? We've, we've still got the rest of the season yeah. to, 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 uh, left. Sorry, premature of me. And we've still got a little, little bit of one more pod in, in, in 2018. But sorry, all that's left for me to say is um, thank you to everybody who's appeared on, on the pod thus far and a Merry Christmas to them and to all our listeners.